This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, it's the 40th anniversary of Oh God. Yes, the film with George Burns and John Denver. And of course, the fellow I have on the phone with me tonight, Moosey Dreyer. How do you do, Moosey? Hello, Greg. And hello. Oh, God, that's a great start. And hello, Canada. Uh, things are well. Thanks, thanks for asking. Thanks yeah. for having me on your show. I like your name. I've never seen that before. What kind of name is that? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tough name to go through public school with as a child. Um, I realize it's unusual. Some people ask me if uh, by chance I'm French or if... Um, you know, or you should hear some point. I get asked a lot if I, uh, I'm from Canada because of moose. You know, people <laughs> call me moose instead of moosey. I, but the, the, the truth is I just had uh, crazy parents. And my father was really good friends with a baseball player who played for the New York Yankees. His name was Bill Moose Gowron. Okay. And somehow my crazy name through my crazy parents. They derived this. You know, I, I was one of many, so I guess they were running out of normal names by the time they got to me. Oh, what are the other names? Do I dare ask? Well, you know, Peggy, Dee Dee, um, uh, Larry. Um, I, I did have a Rocky, but that was his nickname. Lucy is actually my real name, but so that's there. There's that. There's a whole therapy session in that. But uh, but his name was Alan. So yeah, you know, regular names. Well, there's nothing wrong with Moosey. I mean, it it, it stands out. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I'd I never seen it, it before. It, yeah. it, when I'm in a coffee shop or a restaurant or whatever, I always go by Michael, which has nothing at all to do with who I am or my names or my birth certificate or anything. But it's just so much easier because I mean, obviously there's a lot of confusion. They, they don't think they've heard me right if I say Moosey. <laughs> so I get Bruce. I even get Lucy. Yeah. So, okay. It's been a, it's been a challenge, but it's okay. I'm used to it by now. Oh, there you go. Well, you know what? We are uh, celebrating the 40th anniversary of Oh God. I would have been five years old the year that came out. And wow, how the, can it be? Yeah. yeah. It, and it's funny because I grew up in a Christian household, you know, and and uh, that is my religion by trade. But I got to say, though, boy, that film really asked some interesting questions. I, I, I especially love that scene um, towards the end where where um, John Denver is is talking about how crazy he lo- is looking. And and um, George Burns as God goes, um he mentions like Christopher Columbus and all these names. It says you're in good company, and I love that argument. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Yep. Yeah, you know it did. It had a it had a message or or it had many messages, and um, you know I do remember that scene. I, re- I remember that line, and uh, I was at the time. See, this was the '70s. Mm-hmm. It was like a, a. I remember like some churches had issues with the film. Yeah. You know, um, because, you know, of course, they're portraying some mortal older man, George Burns, as God. And, of course, that, you know, rubbed the church the wrong way. It was kind of a Today, it would never even be a, a thing. You know, there's what God Almighty and all these other films that have come out, you know, and I don't think that's ruffled anybody's feathers. But, yeah, at the time, oh, God was a, a tad controversial. You know what? I I don't get this with the church either. You know, I mean, if they if they can put up with these uh these Kirk Cameron films, they should be able to put up. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean seriously. Like, um, I find it doesn't take much to ruffle the church's feathers. <laughs> no, this is true. This is true. You know, and you know, sometimes hey, they you know, you gotta look at yourself in the mirror before you judge others. You know, is what you might say, what I might say to the church, but. <laughs> You know, I don't want to listen. I knew Kurt years ago, and I, you know, he was a nice enough kid and all that stuff. So, you know, I don't, I don't bash him, but I'm, I'm right there with you. Well, I, I, um, I don't drink, but I, I go to the nightclubs with my friends, you know. And I had a youth pastor that found out that I did that, and he, he was like spreading stuff around people, 
as if I was a drunk and a pervert because I went to the clubs. And I'm going to tell you, rather than approach me and have a conversation, I'm going to tell you, I was not too, none too pleased with this. He had somebody come and talk to me about it, you know, like going behind right. my back. Th- this kind of stuff really hurts the image of the church from my perspective. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, he, he, he made a, a false assumption. Yeah. I'm not a drinker either, by the way. Um, no. I made a false assumption. You know, just because you know, once in a while I'll go to someone's birthday and they want to have it at a bar, I'm going to the bar. You know, it's not going to make me drink, you know. Yeah. But I might be seen in a bar, right? And then they was someone to make that false assumption just the same. Yeah, that's, listen, that's on him or her. You know, that, that that's on the person who judges you. That's, you know, let it roll off you. Yeah, well, I know a lot of the DJs in the city, so, and of course, they all do the club scene, you know. In fact, one of the programmers from the station actually uh, DJs at one of the clubs in town. So, I mean, I go and I mingle, you know. You don't have yeah. to drink, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're sober. It doesn't mean you're not alive. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. Besides, your friends have someone who can help, who can drive you home, who can drive them home, you know. That's- I, I, actually, they don't drink either. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we we just go and we hang out. People know us there, you know. The bouncers don't have to throw us out at the end of the night. We're, yeah, we're pretty peaceful. Very good. Yeah. A group of sober barflies. Like yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, I actually haven't been clubbing in a while because getting my friends together is not always easy. But, uh, sure. yeah. But that's the kind of point, you know. I think sometimes the church really does itself an injustice when they do stuff like that. So, yeah, 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 and you know, I thought Oh God was a, it was a good film, and you know, Pete, I think it had a really nice message. Anyway, you know, because I remember correctly, George Burns he did deliver messages about to John Denver's character. Oh uh, yeah, be good, people, be good to people, and all this stuff, and um, you know, then there was the comedic stuff about how you know one regret was uh he made the avocado pits too big um <laughs> you know it was all you know it was just entertainment yeah well you know yeah. what in the yeah. bible god always chose average people like the 12 disciples were like fishermen and stuff like that even you know with joseph and mary you know they weren't right. rich you know they they were average people so i love the fact that john denver just played somebody who worked at a grocery store you know yeah yeah supermarket manager yeah yeah like one of my favorite lines in the movie was uh the judge was played by barnard hughes yep i'm norm- i'm normally not good with names i just i knew him i i worked a lot with bernard hughes and uh I, I do remember him saying, uh, well, to John Denver's character, I believe that you believe, which I don't know why that always stuck with me. It's like, let people believe in what they believe in. You know, you know he doesn't necessarily believe himself, but, so, but he, he believes that he believes, and that, that was good enough. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the film. Of course, you play the, the son of uh, John Denver and Terry Gar in the film. Um, uh-huh. I forget the young uh-huh. lady that played your sister. Her name was Rachel Longacre. Oh, it's okay. All right. Yeah, and uh, I haven't seen her in many years. Uh, we are Facebook friends, whatever that means. You know, like sometimes you're close friends on Facebook. Sometimes you're just Facebook friends, and, you know, you're kind of at a distance or whatever. But I know she's still around. I don't know if she's acting any longer. I don't I have a feeling she's not, but um, she was great. I remember. I, I I remember the years when we did. Oh God! I remember that those years in my life much more vividly than I do, you know, ten years ago. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love Oh God, and um, it has that nice Good. '70s look. You know, uh, very yeah. few times when movies are set in the '70s. I know Boogie Nights did it well, and Fear and Loathing yeah. in Las Vegas did it well, where it actually looked like it was '70s, even though they were made yeah. in the '90s. You know, but sure. I love the look of Oh God. Yeah, yeah, it sure was. It sure had that '70s, and I think John Denver. I think our family car was a a Pacer, which. <laughs> You you don't see anymore. You would only really see those cars. They were so ugly. You would only see those cars in the seventies. But I but I agree with you on the Boogie Nights and a, and a couple other films. They I think they lit it the way films in the seventies used to be lit. Yep. And um, yeah. 
Well, of course, Oh Gob was directed by Carl Reiner, go on and make The Jerk, of course, and, and other various uh -huh. movies. And yeah. Carl's not only a great director, but a very funny guy as well. What was your experience like working with him as a director? Well, it was great. I I have a couple stories or memories about uh, Carl Reiner. Okay. Um, one was, okay, well, one was this. When I first got to the set, um, you know, he took me aside. Hey, how you doing? Listen, the scene's going to go like this, blah, blah, blah. We got to talking. And I asked him about, I said, listen, you know, because I was never a real competitive child actor. You know, I, I always thought the role should just go to the best person for the part. Mm -hmm. And I said, I have a friend, and he's actually still a friend to this day. He, his name is Robbie Risk, and he played Oliver on The Brady Bunch. Okay. Him? I don't know. He had blonde straight hair, and he had white. I mean, he had brown uh, glasses, and he really he looked like a miniature John Denver. He looked so much like him. Okay. And that's, that's what everybody always said about Robbie. And Robbie was also up for the role in Oh God. And so when I got and I met Carl Reiner, I told him, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised. I, I'm, I thought for sure you were going to choose Robbie Risk. You know, and, and, and Mr. Reiner was, I'm sure, kind to, about to Robbie Risk. You know, because Robbie's a good actor and everything. And I don't even know why he told me he chose me. But um, he was a real gracious director. He was super nice. Um, and, okay, so there was a scene that was deleted from the movie that never made it in. Okay. That Carl Reiner explained to me at the premiere why it didn't make it in. And I agree, because it didn't really drive the story. But... Um, but well, we did a scene around the breakfast table, John Denver, Terry Gard, Rachel Longacre, and myself, where the two kids, Rachel and I, are having an argument okay. over, over breakfast about uh, – she, she said, Mom, I want to be a lesbian. <laughs> and the, the whole thing was the poor kid, the character, thought she was trying to say thespian. She wanted to, go, she wanted to be an actor. She wants to be in a play in school. Okay. And I thought that was that was a funny bit, and you know, and I'm like the little old, little bit older brother who's like, you know, you're so dumb. It's thespian, but and it was a funny little scene. Got cut out of the movie, but Carl Reiner was so nice at the premiere. He pulled me aside to explain. Listen, now when you see the movie and you see that that one scene that we did around the breakfast table isn't in it, don't take it personal. You guys were great in it, but it didn't make it for these various reasons. So a lot of directors wouldn't do that. A lot of directors just, you know, they're not compassionate. But um, he was a performer, so he's what you would call an actor's director. Yeah. And um, he's really good. And also, this is what I remember. We shot on we shot at Warner Brothers, the interior of the house. Okay. And the exterior was shot at a house in North Hollywood. But the in, so when we shoot the the in the house stuff, um, we're on a soundstage, and uh, Carl Reiner's son Rob Reiner would would come all the time to the set. I think he was probably shadowing his dad because he was aspiring to be a director himself. Okay, yeah. But I remember being so thrilled. You know, I don't know about you guys up in Canada, but all in the family. Was oh yeah, show here. Oh, it was yeah. big here too. <laughs> Excellent, as it should have been. Now, of course, I don't share the views of Archie Bunker, but I still think it was a great show. But um, but uh, I just remember being so, I mean, George Burns is sitting over there on a chair with a cigar, the legendary George Burns. And I was most excited that Meathead was here watching us work. You know, Meat kind of, <laughs> Meathead, yeah. yeah. You know, this character from All in the Family. And uh, uh, so he would let his son come and um, hang out on the set. And that, that was a big thrill for me because I was a big Archie Bunker fan or, or All in the Family fan. I loved Dolls in the Family as well. I used to watch yeah. that as a kid as well, and very controversial show when that came out. No kidding. I mean, you know, diehard Republican, not even borderline racist. I mean, they weren't even, he was kind of racist, it was, and, and Norman Lear allowed that to, you know, to be in the scripts unapologetically, which is, you know, which is crazy, which is why I preface this whole thing. I don't agree with Archie Bunker's uh, views. Uh, but yeah, a very controversial show and um, and a good one. And it let, paved the way for like Roseanne and one of my personal favorites, Married with Children. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, but my, yeah. Yeah, well, I watch that all the time. <laughs> yeah. I um, still watch clips of Married with Children on uh, YouTube. You know, I still get a kick out of it. But, oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, love though God. And uh, you mentioned George Burns. Now, um, what an interesting, he lived to be 100 years old. And I was just noting to somebody the other day that um, Olivia de Havilland from Gone with the Wind is, is 101, and Kurt Douglas just turned 101. But George Burns made it to 100, and then he, he passed away shortly after. But always with the cigar. And I, th- I think he was like the perfect actor. Uh, to play the, I guess, the human image of God, I guess, in this movie. You want somebody that has kind of that old and wise kind of uh, appeal and yet very comedic because I got a gut feeling, you know, if God appeared, he would have a kindly face, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I thought, listen, I think uh, I'm not in no way patting myself on the back, but I think the film, as far as the main main characters, they were just so uh, perfectly cast. I thought George Burns was great as God. It obviously worked. Here we are talking about the film 40 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I thought John Denver, for someone who wasn't an actor, you know, he was a recording artist, one of my favorite, by the way, just yep. not even because I played his son, but I just liked John Denver a lot. Uh, he was he did a nice job, and, of course, Terry Garr was always good. But, uh, yeah, George Burns, you know, he – what a what – a, pick to play god you know at the time i think it's what makes it so funny is probably what made it a box office draw is okay george burns is playing god i gotta see this you know you get any stories of him on, on the set of well, that film i only remember this i remember um so on on the sound stage at warner brothers he had he was the only one with like an on stage dressing room where the rest of us were in like mobile motorhomes just outside of the stage so because they, they didn't want him walking too far from the dressing room to the camera to the, to the set and all that stuff. Okay. And uh, and I just I do remember you know I was a kid you know or you know twelve or whatever I was and I was you know you don't sit still much so I'd walk around and get her you know there's a lot of time to kill on when when you're shooting a film and uh, I would be around the set and no one would bother George Burns and, and I was no exception I wouldn't say anything I wouldn't initiate anything. But he'd be in there in this with a cigar in his hand, in his like underwear and a robe, in a smoke-filled dressing room. <laughs> and uh, one time I heard, "Hey, kid," and I, you know, I look. He's like, "Come here," you know. And I, I would do anything to remember like what he had to tell me. But he invited me in his dressing room, and I got to hang out, hang out with George Burns. I don't think it was, you know, anything monumental that we spoke about. But um, you know, he he clearly like he clearly didn't mind, you know chatting it up and inviting the you know the kid from the movie into the dressing room and he'd be you know he chuckled i i i was on laughing when i was a uh when i was younger than oh god younger than when i was when i did oh god i was used to be on a Rowan martin's laughing so i did a lot of stuff and perhaps he may have asked me a question about that or whatever um one of the you know i, I haven't acted in years i'm a director but um one of the one of the highlights uh or you know uh trivial um, parts of my life was that I was once uh, asked by when I was a kid and I was on laughing, I was at an NBC network function and uh, Groucho Marx asked me for my autograph. A very oh, wow. Groucho Marx. Yeah. Um, he, he had, he had sent somebody over to my table. It was one of these big um, NBC affiliate parties, uh, black tie, there were round tables, you know, and, he had somebody come to my table and bring him to his table, and he said uh, something about his grandchild, and uh, can I have your autograph so I can pass it on or whatever, because they like you on laughing or whatever. But, you know, hey, Groucho Mark. Wow. Uh, asked me, yeah, that was kind of, that's kind of like a uh, you know, highlight <laughs> as a child. You mentioned laughing. Any stories of Goldie Hawn? Well, let's see. Nothing, nothing too controversial or juicy, but um, she was great. Um, I saw Lily Tomlin about a month ago. Okay, and um, she, you know, she's uh, Lily Tomlin's an amazing woman. She's so so sweet, so talented, and so kind. She's every time I run into her, it's all you know, it's all hugs and laughs. And Did you see her last movie, the- Grandma? You know what? I, I I have not. I did not. Oh, it, she is a powerhouse in it. She's, well, she's a great actor. Oh, she's so good in it. She just still has it. 
Well, gosh, I hope she doesn't hear this and find out that I didn't see her movie, but I'm sure she wouldn't care that much. But, um, yeah, I, that doesn't surprise me. What a talent she is and what what longevity in her career that, that she has. You know, yep. she's she's amazing. Absolutely. She she used to invite me to, on Laughing. there was this character she did. Uh, her name was Edith Ann. Uh, hi, my name is Edith Ann, and I'm five years old. And she would tell a little monologue, a little story from her extremely oversized rocking chair. I don't know if you remember that. You're, you're eight years younger than I, and that was even when I was very, very young. Okay. But, um, you know, she would invite me up, and I'd sit in this oversized rocking chair with uh, Lily Tomlin. I mean, they were all just so great to work with. Um, let's see who else? Ruth, Ruth Buzzy is a sweetheart. Okay. So I, run into, I run into Joanne Worley. Okay. But, you know, as a kid, I was lucky. A lot of people complain about a lot of uh, ex-child actors when they grow up. They kind of complain about their child acting years. I don't know. I got to. I sure missed out on a lot of stuff because of it. Like normal childhood, little league baseball and sports and you know stuff like that. But uh, hey, it was pretty cool. I got to do some pretty cool things. You know. Yeah, you get to hang got- out with George Burns. <laughs> Oh yeah, I I, I met uh, Richard Nixon and John Wayne, and you know, th- back in the day, uh, ev- almost ev- everybody came on Laughing. Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, you know, Laughing was it attracted a lot of people who would just come on and do a little bit and leave. So, oh, who who uh, you know, who would you some, yeah. who, who would you most uh, in awe to meet? Uh, oh, it was John Wayne. Oh, tell me about it. Well, his hands were gigantic. You know, John Wayne was a, a, a man of a very, very tall stature. He was a very, very huge individual anyway. But I remember me being a little kid and him being John Wayne, and he shook my hand, and I just thought a bear was holding on to me. It was <laughs> that's what I remember. In the 70s, there was a film he did called The Cowboys. Okay. I can't remember if it was before or after laughing, but that, there was a movie that I was almost in but didn't, didn't make the cut, called The Cowboys, that I really, really wanted to be in. But it was one of my favorite childhood uh, westerns. And uh, you know, I was a big John Wayne fan. And uh, but it was such a thrill to meet him. I'm trying to think of who else. I mean, you know, Laughing had a crazy amount of uh, legendary people that would come on and, uh, and do a little skit with us nobodies. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Don't, I don't think you're a nobody. Well, I mean, compared to, you know, Frank Sinatra, listen, let me be the first to admit it. <laughs> but I don't mean to nobody, but you know what I mean. Yeah. But, like, today, I don't know. If, I mean, you know, stars of that, that caliber coming on to do a guest spot on a comedy show is not quite as common as it was uh, during Ronan Martin's Laughing. Ronan Ro- Ro- Martin's Laughing was pretty groundbreaking, it, it, you know. When Dick and Dan did the news, mm-hmm. that was kind of like where Saturday Night Live got their weekend update news from. Okay. Uh, the idea, you know, fake news, basically, with, you know, comedic, comic, slapstick stuff. Um, they, they broke a lot of ground on that show. So I think it attracted the, the, the big, big stars. Well, go back to, uh, oh, God, you mentioned John Denver. It's funny, too, because, you know, I still in – movies now um i think it was um oh there was a movie with brie larson out the, earlier this year that had annie's song mentioned it during a uh a shootout scene <laughs> and annie's song was playing and um uh yeah john denver um i think he did a fantastic job just playing the everyman working at the grocery store and um it's sad we lost him way too soon, but what was your memories of working with him? Well, I, even though I was a kid, I had done a lot of stuff. I, I was in a film with jo- uh, Jack Lemmon. I played Jack Lemmon's son. So I sort of was, and we we worked months on this film that I was in. So I, I sort of was already acclimated to being around others who were true professionals and really knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. So when I did Oh God, I was, not surprised, but, you know, I was pleased to see how serious John Denver took uh, his job as an actor. When all I knew him from was Rocky Mountain High and Country Road and on Annie's song and everything. Um, he was he was so into it, and he cared. You know, a lot of actors are just, they don't care that much. They just think that, you know, I don't know, I'm just going to kind of 
get through this and they're lucky to have me and whatnot. He really wanted to do a good job. And there, there was a scene, there was a scene uh, where John Denver is in the shower. Okay. He, I think he has to wipe off the fog of the mirror and he sees George Burns behind him. Yeah. That, that scene to him, when he was done, he shot that one morning in the afternoon I was working with him doing a scene. I think we were playing, it was just a little vignette scene where he and I were playing backgammon on the floor and um, where there was no dialogue. It's just a little montage thing. But I remember him telling me that he was just so relieved that um, he got that scene over with that he was really worried about, which was, you know, he, he knew how important that scene was in the bathroom when God shows up in his house. Okay. Yeah. And, and to answer your question, I was just with about, about him. I was just, Really, it really made me smile and made me feel safe to be in a scene with him, and made me happy to know that he cared so much about about acting when he, in fact, really wasn't an actor up until that point. Yeah, he he did a great job in the film, and uh, he he was very believable. And um, like I said before, in in the Bible, God uses the average people; he doesn't use the people necessarily that other people would pick. And uh, that's sure. what I liked about uh, John Denver's character in the movie. He just worked at a grocery store, and yeah, uh, you know, I think that that was so. Um, and 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 that was so uh, funny and ironic about Paul Sorvino's character, who was the evangelist, and yeah. oh God, who was like, oh, he, yeah, you're telling me that God just met a supermarket assistant manager. That's who he wants to talk to. Blah blah blah. Which. In fact, you know, you're you're making a good point. You know, in the Bible, you know, it was the average person, the regular, you know, the non-standout guy or woman who, you know, God would come to. Yep, absolutely. I, I'm not all that well versed in the Bible, from guy or maybe guy and woman, I don't know. I I, I admit that I don't uh, I don't know all the ins and outs of the Bible, but. I, I read from my Bible, but I'm not a scholar on it, you know. So <laughs> I'm just going by the little bit I know as well. So. Right. Well, yep. it doesn't mean I don't believe in God because I do, but I'm just not. Um, you know, I, the the stories. I never really actually felt the stories touch me as much as just you know the the my just general faith in the spirit of it of of God. But um, Paul Servino, I ran into a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've worked with him a couple times, and so. So here I go. We're at a book signing that my girlfriend gets invited to because my girlfriend was very famous as well. Um, she gets invited to these things, and I go along with her. We've been together for five years, or we're in our fifth year now of okay. being together. And uh, so I go to a lot of functions with her. So we go to this uh, thing that she was invited to, uh, Paul Servino uh, book signing. I think it's a cookbook that he and his wife put out. And I don't mean to throw Paul Sabino under the bus. I think he's great, amazing, and good fellows, and he's a, he's a great actor. But I, I never do this. I rarely approach anybody. You know, I don't know. I stay under the radar. But you know, my girlfriend's just, listen. Just go say something to him. Go, just go. You were in the film together. Go, whatever. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you know, hey, uh, you're Paul. We when I, we shook hands, I said, uh, we were both in Oh God together. Uh, you know, you were great in that, and I haven't seen you in all these years. And I don't know what the deal was. He just didn't. He, I may as well have said, "Hey, we did jury duty together in 1978." <laughs> uh, he did. He he had no interest in uh, in re re uh, capping the uh, oh god days. But uh, but that's neither here nor there. I, I give everybody a little forgiveness level, and that you know maybe he. I don't know what kind of day he had, but he was really good in oh god too. Yes, you he had was. to have that nemesis of John Denver. You had to have that guy you root against. You know. Yeah, and the evangelist you, got the guy full of himself with the gold watch. And considering the it. fact there's so many evangelists right now using God and the Bible for profit, yeah, yeah, <laughs> misleading yeah. a lot of people, yeah, yeah. His case was a clear, clear symbol of that, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, Terry Garr had quite the career too, you know, in Scorsese's After Hours, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and of course in Oh God as well. Um, uh, any memories of her? Absolutely. She, um, you know, when you work, when you work, you know, a few months on a project, you kind of become family. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had a lot of Suzanne Plachette was kind of like a a mom to me. I was a regular or a semi-regular on the old Bob Newhart show. Mm -hmm. And that was one example. And Terry Garr also felt was kind of like a mother figure. You know, she kind of looked out after me, 
really cool. One of the nicest, nicest, nicest human beings. I hope she's doing well. I know she's battling MS. Yes. Uh, but she's super nice, super, super funny. I, my favorite scene in Tootsie is her pounding the bed and just, and just in frustration because Dustin Hoffman's not showing up. Uh, she just, she, she could, she could act without dialogue and tell a story without even speaking, you know, as, as well as anybody. Um, what a great woman. Great career, too. Yeah, love Terry Gar. Oh, God had a lot of interesting uh, actors and a lot of uh, not with us anyway. Although I'm going to say this. Um, I was so honored. I had William Daniels on my show back in May and uh, for the um, 50th anniversary of The Graduate. And, of course, we talked a little bit about uh, Oh, God, and he was in that as well. Who Now, who, let's see. Oh, good. Can you repeat the name? William Daniels. He played Dustin Hoffman's father in The Graduate. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, he was. I'm trying, in... to, I'm trying to picture him in Oh God. Um, I'm not always great with names. Of course, if I saw his face in a, in a heartbeat, I would, I would know who that was. I don't know whether Oh God is on Blu-ray yet because I don't have it home, and I would like to get it on Blu-ray. And it's been a while since I've seen it, but um, I'd love to get it on Blu-ray. But uh, I know that he was in that and. Uh, of course, Donald Pleasance. Uh, he Donald did, Pleasance. He there did this the yeah. year before Halloween, and uh, of course, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It, it, um, Donald Pleasance and uh, Ralph Bellamy, of course, from Rosemary's Baby. Um, had, uh, I know that you didn't have much for scenes with them, but do you have? Did you interact with them any, even offset? I remember meeting Ralph Bellamy. Uh, I didn't have any scenes with him. Um, I primarily only had scenes with, you know, my character's family members because mm -hmm. I, I think, and rightfully so, within the story, you know, uh, Denver and Jared Gar were trying to protect, protect their children from being, you know, in, 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 uh, front of the media and all that stuff. I mean, I think there's a scene where we leave the house and we go through, you know the reporters or whatever yep. but uh no i didn't really have i didn't have scenes with uh i do remember meeting paul Servino and hanging out there mm -hmm. uh but i didn't have scenes with paul Servino either in that film do you have the did, did I, it sounds to me like you had a good time on the film but what, what was the most difficult part about doing the film anything um I don't really think, I, I mean, there are many projects I've done where I've had difficult times, but there's nothing that stands out about Oh God because, and I think it always starts with the top. Carl Reiner was a really kind man. Mm -hmm. He's actor's director, kept everybody comfortable and laughing. Um, I don't really have anything difficult. I do have something interesting that I've never forgot, and I don't know what it means. It, maybe it's some sort of statement about uh, human behavior, but... Um, so this isn't difficult. I'm, I'm going off track, but I, I will share this with you because it's always stuck with me. So um, well, we were shooting the exterior of what's supposed to be the Lander's house. In okay. Oh, God, our family's house. Okay. Um, you know, we were not, uh, you know, it was in between scenes. The cameras weren't rolling. I think we were taking a break or whatever. But John Denver and I were walking to our dressing rooms down the street in the, in the neighborhood of North Hollywood. And, you know, all kinds of neighbors were standing around because, oh, movies being shot. And then, you know, John Denver was a big deal and all that stuff. But there was a guy who would carry a tape recorder around, and you know, a cassette tape recorder, 1970s recorder, not like we have today. And he would, whenever we would walk to and from the house, he would press play, and it would be John Denver, like Rocky Mountain High. It was like John Denver's greatest hit. For some reason, he felt the need to... Press play, play John Denver's music, and walk alongside John Denver and play Denver's music to him. I just thought it was so odd, and so did Denver. Den Den John Denver, very, very kind man, really just didn't wasn't that amused and didn't want much. It didn't really understand it either. But uh, yeah, I just thought that was strange okay. to play a, a, a recording artist's music to him and walk along with him. Okay. I, I, I don't understand. I never understood that behavior of uh, like what is it? Why, what's the thrill? I, and it's odd, and it mean, and it doesn't really 
say much, and there's, that's all there is to that story, but I just, I just never forgot it. Okay. Well, yeah. you've got some other films I want to touch base on as well. Like sure. you, This one here I haven't seen, but I would like to see it, and I forget who it was I interviewed. For, um, I interviewed this person from another film, but this one tie, uh, was one of his credits, and I can't remember who it was, but it was American Hot Wax. Yeah, yeah. You worked with uh, Floyd uh, um, Metric uh, twice, yeah. and um, and American Hot Wax and the Hollywood Nights. Now uh, we'll talk about yeah. uh, American Hot Wax for a second. Uh, you must you must have had a good working relationship with uh, Floyd to work with him two times. Well, yeah. Interesting enough, what happened for American Hot Wax was this is the American Hot Wax came first, and then. Hollywood Nights came second. And yeah. I'm, you know, I'm forever grateful to, to Floyd because he, he put me in both films. I mean, I, you know, I worked with Michelle Pfeiffer on, you know, early on and, uh, Fran Drescher and, and, uh, you know, Jay Leno was in American Hot Wax and Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis and the list goes on. Both, both great experiences. Well, I, uh, this is what happened with American Hot Wax. They, I, I mentioned in the book uh, written by Anthony Kiedis, who is the front man for uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Okay. When he was a teenager, he really wanted to be an actor. Okay. And he kept getting called back for this role as Artie Moretz in, in, in uh, American Hot Wax. Mm-hmm. And he, he had a mul- multiple callbacks, and for some reason they just weren't re- willing to pull the trigger on him. Probably nothing to do with Anthony. I bet he was a great actor. You know, he's a performer. Um, but so they decided to open it up and audition more people. And at the very last moment, like I, I went in and read for the role and I got it. Um, Floyd walked me right out of the office and into another office and said, get this kid to wardrobe and start measuring him, which, which is unheard of in, in most cases in, in Hollywood. Um, and I think I was, we started shooting the very next day. That's how much, how late in the 11th hour of casting I got that role. Because Anthony Kiedis was just about to be cast in it. So that's why Kiedis wrote that in his book. And it w- worked. And I ran into him not too long ago. And I told him how much, listen, I know he knows, I know you know this, but it certainly worked out for you. Because the, the whole point of him mentioning the story in the book was it turned him to start focusing on his music and now he's a big rock star wow. so you know i got to shake his hand and say listen you it worked out well and uh, you know and I'm, I'm glad it worked out this way for you anyway so that's so that's good so but american hot wax was great it was a film probably took about 12 weeks to shoot probably only needed about six weeks to shoot okay. it was crazy like the the, the schedule we would, we would sit around for days we'd go in go to makeup go to wardrobe hang out. I remember hanging out with Lorraine Newman a lot. And uh, we could, you could sit there all day for 12 hours and then be dismissed and go home and you never shot a single thing. Oh, wow. One of those films where it was a Paramount film, so there was plenty of money. They weren't worrying about paying people who didn't need to be paid or anything like that. So, you know, spent a long, long time on that film. Uh, all of us did. Um I'm just rambling. What was your question, Greg? I'm sorry. Oh, no, we're talking about American Hot Wax. No, you're what not. My, you're well, not. Just in general, what were my experiences? Well, my experience was a whole lot of smoking because my character was this yeah, teenager. I was probably about 14 or 15 by then, who, um, and it took place in the 50s. The, the film was about uh, this man named Alan Freed, mm-hmm. who who uh, basically um, got shut down by the IRS. And, you know, these shows got shut down, and he was you know a promoter who, who kept bringing in these big rock and roll acts. And uh, my character was the president of the Buddy Holly fan club who uh, finagled his way into Alan Freed. Oh, Alan, Alan Freed was a disc jockey as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I got into the radio station with Alan Freed, there's a great there's a clip I remembered that that I somebody sh- sent me recently on YouTube about this scene where Jay Leno walks me into the scene uh, to the studio with Alan Freed, and I sit down and I talk about the day that I found out Buddy Holly died because my character was a huge Buddy Holly fan, but I smoked throughout and I, I didn't smoke in real life I'm a kid I was a kid, and and not only did I smoke they had me smoking filterless. Um, 
what what were the like the not the camels, but um, what was it? Not Paul Mall. I don't Lucky know. Strike. Filter, oh. Filterless Lucky Strike cigarettes, which is about the strongest cigarette you can smoke. So half the time during the whole shooting, I was felt like I was going to vomit. Oh wow! Uh, to be honest with you, but you know, my hair got I got greased my hair and we dressed up like the fifties and driving nice cars and the, overall the, the experience was was just amazing. And it's a good film. That film got into some legal situation where it didn't get released on DVD, and it's I don't even know if it's released on DVD now. Uh, it had something to do with the music rights because all the music in there is real music that from all different types of artists. And there was a, a big legal holdup in that film. It, I wish more people would have seen it. It was done very, very well. I'm really proud to be a part of it. Jay Leno uh, is one of his favorite films, he says. Um, and Yeah, before before Leno was a comedian, he was an actor as well. I heard a similar story, too, about the movie Get Crazy as well, about, you know, it's not released on, on, on uh, Blu-ray or anything like that, too, and I heard something about the music and this and that, and I wish something gets straightened out so people could see these films. No kidding. What a shame. Yeah. Uh, what a shame because American Hot Wax has so many big, talented people in it, and, uh, you know, they poured so much money. Paramount put so much money into that film. It looks amazing. Uh, William Fraker, who was a cinematographer, an Oscar-winning uh, cinematographer, shot that. It's beautiful. It would hold up today. I haven't seen it in a long time, but I think the film would hold up today. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, w- I wish more people could have seen that film. And, of course, Fran Drescher is in that. And oh, I love Fran and that voice and that laugh. Tell me about <laughs> Fran. <laughs> yeah, she's great. Uh, I had no negative experiences with that film, or Fran was also in Hollywood Nights. Okay. Um, I ran into her at a Laker game a few years ago, and she was just, you know, couldn't hug me hard enough. And it was she's such a sweetheart. She was great. Um, but what a what a character! What talk about an actor who wasn't afraid to take chances? You yeah. know, she made a choice of her character, and she just went with it. And I uh, got, got to appreciate her for that. Did she distract the Lakers with her wardrobe? <laughs> you know what? This is L.A. I don't. I, I think she'd have to do something unbelievable to distract the Lakers. It's LA. It's, it's not just Drescher. It's, it's you, the wardrobes you'd see here are pretty outlandish and, uh, and crazy. I always loved Fran. You know, I used to watch the nanny. I loved the laugh. Um, she was a nice uh-huh. looking, and of course you could see her do even kind of dramatic stuff. And this is spinal tap. You know, I think she was a little underrated, uh, in terms of what she could do. She got kind of typed because of her voice, but I think she was a little bit better than that. Absolutely. I agree. I love, this is spinal tap. It's one of my favorite films. Yes. I, I actually, um, I, I, I work now, I, I wear two hats. I'm a director. The only thing uh, that's close to acting anymore that I do is voiceover work. And I have worked on a few films with Rob Reiner in recent years. And I, the last one, we were really talking a lot about, uh, uh Oh God, he, you know, I was reminding him how he used to go to the set and you know, how I met him back then. And, uh, uh, but this is spinal tap is a fantastic film. And the film I worked on, I, the last film I worked on with Rob Reiner was, uh, called shock and awe okay it's not out yet but uh, a very very good political journalistic film <laughs> any other thoughts on uh, jay leno uh, being on that film with him jay well yeah, absolutely um if you live in la all you have to do is kind of walk around the streets and you're gonna see jay leno it's and it's a huge city Eventually, you're going to see him, and I'll tell you why. Because one thing, he has an extensive car collection, and yeah. every car he takes out of his, he must have an airport hangar uh, to put all his cars in. Every time you see him in a different car, it's a car that you can't not notice. You know, an old Model T or something just amazing. You know, which is in a restored and beautiful, and the most of them are convertibles. And Jay's very recognizable. And we have our Jay Leno in L.A. just driving around. And he's so kind and he waves. And I, you know, and, and uh, Aaron and I saw him at a bagel shop not too long ago. And he's just kind. I wish I, 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 wish I had some stories, like some real juicy stories to tell you. But 
it sounds like everybody I've worked with are, are pretty darn nice. <laughs> I heard I heard J- I heard Jay Leno's very approachable too. Like I I heard he's super he's, approachable. He's, yeah, he's very humble still, still very nice. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And of course uh, he used to he Jay used to invite me to the improv. Okay. We became good friends actually during the sh- the filming of American Hot Wax. Okay. And I was uh, one of the only kids uh, at the Hollywood Improv who was a regular um, you know guest or customer. And I would sit there and um, stand around with Jay Leno and Andy Kaufman. Okay. Just before they, they would both, both go on. And I, I remember many times talking, Andy Kaufman and I, having these conversations, because I was a fan of Taxi. I liked Latka. I was a huge fan. Yep. What a crazy guy. What a crazy character. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he would be, he would, stand, he would stand, uh, Kaufman would stand there and talk to me in a normal voice. And he was seemed totally fine and regular. He asked me questions. He wasn't like, a, you know, all full of himself. He cared about other people he was talking to. And I, I really enjoyed that. I liked him for that. Of course, all I wanted to do was talk about Taxi. Was this and, be- uh, then you know he would hear we we'd hear his name and walk into the stage Andy <laughs> Kaufman, and he would leave this conversation I was having with a normal conversation, and get up on stage and he's three other lunatic people. He just he he was just so gifted and talented. He didn't have to like have all sorts of preparation. He was never nervous. He was he seemed normal and he and then you know thirty forty feet away on stage he's crazy. And you know, and not crazy, but you know what I mean. He'd do Elvis Presley. He, you're you're familiar with Andy Kaufman, right? Oh yeah, that whole story oh, about yeah. him and Jerry Lawler and the wrestling thing was bi- a big thing too. Did you see? Uh, did you see Man on the Moon? Oh yeah, Jerry? yep, there's I did. There's a documentary. There's a documentary out right now called Jim and Andy. Yeah, I highly suggest it. It's phenomenal. It's so interesting, and it's real footage of Jim Carrey. It's 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 how Jim Carrey. Dating character is Andy Kaufman during the filming of Man on the Moon. It's just a shameless plug for something I I wasn't a part of. I'm plugging it just because I highly recommend it. Great, oh, yeah. great documentary, Jim and Andy. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, I remember, like, that whole thing about the wrestling and Jerry Lawler. And it's, it's funny because uh, people bought into it, and yet in reality, you know, it was all, uh, all a stage. <laughs> Right. And it's brilliant. Right. Yeah. Oh, what I was going to say about Leno, and uh, so he used to invite me as his guest to the improv. Okay. So my older sister, who was my legal guardian, all uh, would take me to the, she'd go to the improv with us. and uh, But I'd get to hang out, like, backstage with, with Jay. And um, he was the only one, like, who, he his act was always really clean. Mm-hmm. I mean, perfectly clean. Every other comic had the F word, and, you know, every other word. And he was like, but he was, he was never, you know, <laughs> he was never dirty. I always appreciated that. Now, you know, as a teenager, you want to hear curse words. You think, you know, yeah, I'm being bad. You know, I'm like a grown up. I can hear these things. But uh, Jay, Jay was funny and brilliant up there without ever having to crutch on, you know, sex humor or toilet humor or anything like that. And I always appreciated that about his his talent. Oh, absolutely. Now, of course, yeah. the other Floyd uh, Metro film you did, Hollywood Nights, of course, you get to work with Tony Danza and Michelle Pfeiffer. Of course, Michelle Pfeiffer, mm-hmm. what a looker back then, huh? It still is. <laughs> well, M- Michelle Pfeiffer was, and probably still is, I mean, I, I still think she's beautiful, but was, when she was in Hollywood Nights, one of the most beautiful human beings you'd ever lay your eyes on. I mean, she was, you, you know this, she was stunning. Now, I don't mean to, you know, slight her in any way, but she, she might, she would probably tell you the sick, she was new at acting and wasn't exactly M- M- Michelle Pfeiffer then. You know what I mean? She wasn't mm-hmm. Meryl Streep. <laughs> she, she, I, you know, if you, if you ever, I haven't seen Hollywood Nights in a long time, but I, I do remember she was kind of stiff and maybe, you know, maybe not the greatest actress. That's all. But, Boy, did she turn that around? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And but a looker, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what about Tony Danza? Tony's a great guy. Mm-hmm. He uh, he was great. He um, Tony used to bring his son on the set, so you know, it was cool when I wasn't in, in, in a scene. I would hang out with his son, and then some years later, I was uh, playing on a softball team, 
And I look, I get up to bat, I didn't even realize it. And, oh, no, one or two pitches had gone by before he and I even realized he's the pitcher and I'm the batter. He said, are, is this, is that, are you, is that Moosey? Because somebody might have yelled, come on, Moose, or whatever. And we both realized it was, we were playing on a softball team, uh, in a softball game against each other. Um, and uh, he's another one, you know, if you, you might not see him for years and he will completely be kind, remember you and, you know, and be engaged in a conversation. Tony, I always like Tony Danza a whole lot. I really you know, like I say that because, yeah. you know, not every actor is that not every actor is that way. You know, it's just, unfortunately there are many who are very full of themselves and think they're too good. And then, you know, they probably remember you, but they pretend they don't because they're too cool for school and, and whatnot. That's just the truth, you know, but, Tony was not that. Tony's a great guy. Tony, I liked him recently in that movie. Jo John uh, Joseph um, Gordon Levitt shot recently called Don John. You get to see Tony Danza do a more Correct. dramatic part. You know. Greg. Yeah. Oh. I yeah. Cut out there for a minute. Oh, you were saying. I'm sorry. Somehow. Oh, gee, somehow no, I, I didn't catch you that. You liked him. You liked Tony. The last thing I heard was you. I liked Tony in the movie recently, and then you went away. Oh, okay. No, it was called Don John. Uh, John uh, Gordon Joseph Levitt directed it, and uh, Tony Danza played his father in it. It was a little more dramatic role for Tony, and he was really good in it. For him. Yeah. Sure, yeah. No, I, I have not seen that. Yeah. Oh, it's really and good. He's a good actor. Oh so yeah. He, here's a guy who came from. Uh, he was a boxer. Before he got onto Taxi, yeah, so just like John Denver, you know, he came from being faint, you know, being having one profession and into another. And uh, Tony, Tony was very good. Yeah, I'm gonna go go back a few years for you, back before Oh God, because I noticed on Internet Movie Database you're uncredited for this, but I gotta ask about Up the Sandbox with Barbara Streisand. Yeah, well, <laughs> Up the Sandbox was a film that I was requested by Barbara Streisand to come. I think she was a fan of Latin. Okay. So she she uh, requested me, so I come and I shoot a couple days. This is what I remember. It was one scene that I was in. It was a party scene where I was with a couple other kids, and I, I either got cut out or I think maybe I had one line by the time the film went to print. Um, so I'm not really substantially in that movie, but the fact that I got to meet and work, uh, with Barbara Streisand was uh, a thrill. <laughs> it was a huge thrill for my mother at the time. So that was very, very young then. I, I can't remember. I, mean, I might've been six or seven years old. I remember doing it, but I, you know, at some things I was so young. I, I, I didn't realize, um, exactly the caliber of people I was with at that point, you know, Barbra Streisand. And it was directed by Irvin Kirshner, of course, it went on to do um, Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and, of course, another film, we'll go back, you mentioned Jack Lemmon, of course, earlier, the war yeah. between um, men and women with Jack uh, yeah. Lemmon and Jason Robarbs and uh, Barbara mm -hmm. Harris. Yeah. Do you have any memories of that? I have many memories that uh, we shot in New York for a long time. And then we shot on the Island of Catalina, which is 26 miles off the shore from Los Angeles. Um, it was my first theatrical job. The only acting I'd done before that film <clears throat> was a couple of commercials. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, that, I do have memories. You know, my character was, uh, I was, uh, I was, biologically Jason Robards' son, but Jack Lemmon and my mo mother got together after Jason Robards and, my, and Barbara Harris had split. So a lot of my scenes were father-son, but it, it was really stepfather, I guess I was, uh, he was of mine in the film. He would, well, he'd come out of the bedroom at night, he, and it was, it was a true story about, gosh, this artist, Arthur somebody, uh, it's been so long. And he could barely see without his glasses. And he would come out in the middle of the night, he'd hear a noise. And he, he was, uh, in the film, it was an ongoing bit where he would trip over his, his stepson. <laughs> and uh, that was me. And so, you know, he'd, what are you, Bobby, or whatever my name was, what are you doing? And we'd have a little scene. I'd have a little one-on-one -on -one dialogue with Jack Lemmon. And 
you know, uh, that was kind of my running bit. I was in, you know, throughout the film and other things, but my bit was that I was scared of everything, so I had to sleep in front of the parents' door. Okay. Um, and we went to New York. Uh, Mel Shavelson was his name, who directed it. Very kind man. Uh, Herb Edelman, who I worked a lot with after that, was in that film. I like that film. That was a very, uh, very inventive film. Um, this artist who would draw these characters, and the characters would actually start animating and coming to life and telling the story that you're watching. Okay. For, yeah, I don't think the film did very well, but for its time, it was uh, it was a, a departure from the norm. So. Absolutely. Now, yeah. you've also done quite a lot of television as well. Um, what television have you done that that um that you've done quite a bit what stands out to you as your best experiences with tv uh i loved bob newhart show mm -hmm. um family ties was nice i did a uh i did a movie of the week with barnard hughes who was the judge in oh god okay uh and uh i was and david soul from starsky and hutch Okay, and we were we were the three three generations. I was David Soul's son. Barnard was uh, David Soul's father, and uh, I was a sixteen year old with <clears throat> terminal cancer. Uh, clearly not a comedy, um, but uh, it was a movie of the week where I really got to feel like you know I'm acting. You know, like I, I love the art. I used to love the art of acting. Of course, I've I strayed away from that. Decided not to be an actor after a certain time. I wanted to be a director, but um, I loved the art of acting, and that that um, we shot that up in Northern California. Um, I always enjoyed things that would be on location, away from town, because then you can focus on the work, yeah. as opposed to co coming home to your own home every night and getting up early and going back to the studio. There were just less distractions, and you can really focus on what you're doing. Okay. Um, what else? What else? I don't know. I did a lot of. I also did a lot of stuff that you know. I'm not saying I'm not proud of, but you know, very cookie cutter television like the A Team and Hunter and um, you know stuff like that. Well, you mentioned um, Bob Newhart and Three's Three's Company. What's what, Three's Company? No. Oh, Family, Family Ties. Then, Family Ties. Family yeah. Ties. I'm sorry. Okay, those two shows. What what ma what made those two shows so special? Well. Uh, the fam family ties just because I'm friends with Michael J. Fox and he's a good guy and, and I had a big crush on Justine Bateman and that was fun to do. Don't blame you. <laughs> uh, but um, I uh, was a semi-regular on a reoccurring regular on the Bob Newhart show. I used to play uh, Little Howie, which is Howard, the pilot next door's son. Okay. And um, so because of that, I, I wasn't on every episode, but I would come. I, you know, they keep writing my character an episode here and there, and I'd come back. So it felt like it wasn't too taxing. I wasn't spending too many weeks in a row there, yet it was still family. Um, and listen, Bobby Hart is a genius, or still, I, I, I was going to say was, but he still is. Yes. Because Aaron. Erin is my girlfriend, Erin Murphy. She was little Tabitha on Bewitched. Yes. And she she and I go to uh, Academy Television Academy events when it sounds interesting. And they had one about six months ago. Uh, it was a tribute to Bob Newhart. So we go to the Television Academy, the packed house. Bob is on stage, and he's being interviewed by Seth Meyers. Okay. Uh, and... Um, he held the audience for about 90 minutes and he now bob's old now mm -hmm. he was quick hilarious entertaining he looked happy i was so pleased when i left that night like bob newhart is doing well I and mean, he was a genius and that and and he was great and suzanne Plachette was 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 wonderful how uh, bill daly played my father or i played his son rather on the bob newhart show uh, he really took me in as kind of a second son, um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about um, sitcom timing through Bill Daly. He was very open to sharing the methods that he uses, um, you know, simple ones, just like, um, you know, making an entrance. You know, I think I, I always feel that Bill, uh, that Bill Daly was the original uh, Kramer from Seinfeld, even though 
Michael Richards, I believe was his name, would come in, you know, and do this crazy entrance on Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. Bill Daly's was much more subdued, but he would really come in with a certain energy that you just felt when you're watching the scene that he's not just walking in. He's coming from somewhere. And it's hard to explain, and it may even be subtle sometimes, but he, he just made his entrances believable. And that's just a little thing, but it really is an important part of painting a, a painting the whole picture of your character um, in a story. Um, so Bill was great. Marsha Wallace, God bless her, God rest her soul. She was she was a sweetheart. Peter Bonners went on to direct a lot. Uh, he played the dentist. Uh, Jerry, I believe his character's name was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Bobby Hart show was nothing but a, a pleasant experience. You mentioned Family Ties. You said you had a crush on Justine Bateman. I don't blame sure. you there. Um, sure. What was it like when you showed up there? You had a crush on her. What What, what was it like to meet her, knowing you had a crush on her? Did Did, did she oh, Did great. she know? No, no. I was so, you know, I was in my 20s then. Like, I acted well into my 30s. You know, we talked, we were talking a lot about our, my, my, my younger stuff, and that's fine and, and all that. It's very nostalgic. But I, you know, by the time I, I did Family Ties, and I only did an episode of Family Ties, by the way, but it, you asked me what were my favorite, you know, experiences in television. And sometimes it's a, five season long show or sometimes it's just a one episode guest spot but when i i, I was too cool greg to, <laughs> to tip my hand that you know i had a big crush on justine so i probably didn't even i probably made a point of not paying too much attention to her you know like yeah i was yeah, 20 <laughs> 20 years old or 23 years. i actually don't even remember what, what age i was then but i know I, I wasn't a kid anymore so yeah i had to play it cool Oh, so, man. Which you... is probably not the way to go because, you know, she, I never got to date her. <laughs> I wish that uh, Jason Bateman would, like, pull her back into the spotlight in one of his movies. You know, I kind of miss her. I, I did see her some years back because she was – I was working on a show called Men in Trees, the Anne Hayes show, and she did a certain amount of episodes of that. So I'm, I was walking out of the room where I was doing my vocal – my voice work – uh, for for men and trees as she was coming in and said hi and you know I didn't stop her hey I did your show blah 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 uh, or anything like that I never really even knew her very well um, but she looked great and I remember at the time thinking well heck look at that she's back and she's acting but I haven't seen her now men and trees was canceled at some point and uh, I haven't seen Justine Bateman on anything but uh, how about the uh, reemergence after all the years of uh, Jason Bateman's career. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I still like Jason. In fact, I was watching Office Christmas Party. It's one of my Christmas movie watchers uh, for for this season, you know. And I like Jason. He's got a very everyman quality to him, you know. He's a very affable guy. He's very likable. Mm -hmm. And he's really good. Yeah. He's not just, it's not just a nostalgic thing. Oh, let's take a ex-child actor and you know, see what he can do. Now, he's good. He deserves. He deserves all the the um, accomplishments that he's that he's currently having. That's for sure. Well, he directed a movie called Bad Words, and I I went and saw it twice in the theater. I really enjoyed that. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't see that one. Oh yeah, he directed it and he starred in it. It's like um, uh, Little Miss Sunshine clashed with Bad Santa. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's a nice mixture. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it was really funny, but uh, he's also a really good filmmaker as well. But uh, So you do a lot of voice work now, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's something I had done, started doing maybe in my mid-20s to late-20s. I started getting asked if I would come and do some voice work. Um, I mean, I did I did some cartoons when I was a little kid, Hanna Barbera cartoons with Mickey Dolenz and Jackie Earl Haley Jr. and stuff. We were on a show together, but really started doing voice work on a regular basis in my mid to late twenties. And then that's the one part of acting I don't mind hanging on to because uh, I enjoy it, and it uh, it you know it pays for the, pays my mortgage. You know, you gotta. I'm a father. I have one child, and mm -hmm. you know, you gotta you gotta pay the bills. And my heart is in directing, and I have done some. I directed some stuff, some TV shows and stuff. But 
you know, without voiceover work, it, uh, life would be, you know, a little bit more of a struggle. So, and I do jo- enjoy doing it. Anything um, stand out to you that uh, you did voiceover that you really enjoyed doing? Because I know you got a whole list of stuff. Uh, well, I remember when we we went in one day, do some voices for some movie called Shrek, and we're like, "What is this?" Okay. Yeah. And, we're, and you know, when we go in there, the animation's already, you know, most of it's already done. So here we're we're looking at the character Shrek who was, you know, of course, played by Mike Myers and all these. And watching this film and, like, I was watching it. I remember we were watching it without the sound and just looking at the visuals. And, you know, some of us voice actors were looking at each other like, it's a job. I mean, what is this? Like, you know, and then, you know, of course, and then we're starting to hear the sound and then we're starting to say, hey, this is good. This is funny or whatever. And then then it became Shrek, you know, mm-hmm. it became a big deal. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed doing that. Madagascar was a, a, a fun film to do. Um, I God, love well, African wildlife. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's a nice little niche to be in. I'm, I'm very grateful for it, for the, the voiceover work. So uh, that that's what you're doing now, right? And you mentioned directing. Yeah. Any anything coming up that you're allowed to talk about? Um, some I'm not allowed to talk about. Some I am. Uh, you know, you sign non-disclosure agreements on some, which is kind of silly because I don't know what damage it would do. But I don't. I don't talk because if I sign it, I, I don't talk about it. That's but, okay. That's okay. Um, I did. Uh, let's see. Well, shock and awe I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. that that film. Uh, I just came home a couple of days ago from. Northern California, George Lucas has a studio called Skywalker Ranch. Okay, um, yeah. Up in Northern California where all the Star Wars magic gets done. But Sky, the sound department, Skywalker Sound, they do a lot of post-production for all kinds of stuff, all, all many, many films. So periodically I get to fly up there and uh, get a hotel room and work with some great friends and do – I just did a, a – let's see, we did a small film. Robert Forster and Hilary Swank. Oh wow! Um, called the way called what we had. Okay. And, and it's about Alzheimer's, and it's a very touching film. Very, uh, really tugs at your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, I did Jurassic Jurassic World, the the most uh, uh, recent. We're not. Kidding. You know, I worked on two days on the film, and I can't even remember. I don't even know. I know they're all called different things. There's Jurassic Park, <laughs> Jurassic World, whatever the ones that is, that is about to come out, I worked on. Okay. Now, okay. I, I only did, you know, um, here's an example. Sometimes uh, it is really, sometimes I'll do something, you know, that's nice. It's really prominent, you know, when you do voiceover work. You're the weatherman in a, an important scene or, or a newscaster, you know, delivering story breaking information that turns the whole film you know or something but then other times i'm the voice on the tram at the jurassic world you know keep your arms and you know keep your hands and arms in the tram and like if you look to your left you're going to see that whatever you know uh and so uh yeah jurassic world i think i was i was definitely a tram guy and i was a you know we do police radio you know announcements and we do the police voices on the radio it's a silly little niche in the business but it's you know they have to record it and someone's got to do it mm-hmm. and they don't want to pay cnn or you know a network to to do to do like a, a a newscaster because you have to get it's much more expensive for them they'd rather pay us the screen actors guild day rate and we will do the voice and we get the residuals and they pay us handsomely and there's no no complaints there but it will cost them a lot more to take stuff from you know, stock footage and stuff from real newscasters. And, and plus, a lot of times, what you have to say is very pertinent to the script. So they need to re-record it anyway, or, or record it for the first time anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know what? Uh, th- this this has been great. I, I've been very happy to have you on there. I'm really, really glad that you're you're out of harm's way with the recent fires that's been happening. Ah, thank in the, you. Yeah, I know when you and I first touched base, uh, you, you were on fire watch. Is, is it Did dying down it? there? Is what? what is, one more time? Are the fires dying down yet? 
Well, they are and they're not. Yeah, they they are. They have uh, in some areas. Thankfully for me, um, on the selfish level, for me, I'm out of harm's way. But my heart goes out to. Uh, we have next to Los Angeles County, we have Ventura County, which is just north of us. That's where Santa Barbara is. When I was flying in two nights ago, coming back from Luke uh, uh, from Skywalker Ranch, you can look out to one side of the airplane and you can just see the mountains on fire, and it's just heartbreaking and scary. And they don't fully have it under control, and people are losing their homes. It's just, it's just sad. And uh, you know, that's what are you going to do? It's the double-edged sword of living, you know, in Los Angeles. We don't get a lot of rain, so it's dry. It's green, but dry at the same time. It's hard to explain. It's still pretty, but it's dry. We need rain. Um, and, you know, the double-edged sword is that, you know, it's mid-December, and the last couple of days have been 80 degrees, 81 degrees. I, I don't mean to rub it in there, Canada. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, I, can, I, I we get these Decembers. I had a programmer in here before I came on to interview you. He's saying, it's freezing out there. <laughs> Oh, you mean where? You mean here in L.A.? No, uh, in Canada here. Oh, like oh, just oh. outside here. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. It must be freezing for you guys. Yeah. Listen, I love Canada. I, I've, I've shot up there three different times, and uh, all on the other part of Canada from you. I was in British Columbia. You know, we fly into Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Uh, and every time I've come home from shooting a job, doing a film or a commercial, uh, I remember, like, for – Munch just holding on to this idea of, I'm going to move to Canada. The people were so great. I love Canada. We have such a crazy country here. Mm-hmm. You know, not that I don't love America, but, you know, it's a little kooky. Yeah. Um, but I've always loved Canada. I always thought about, ah, maybe maybe that's where I'm going to end up, you know. I did a movie there called Ants. Okay. It was the, cheesi- it was the cheesiest two-hour television movie. It was about these killer ants. Okay. It was with Suzanne Summers. And Myrna Loy, I had a one-on-one scene with Myrna Loy, which is pretty, pretty lucky on my part, mm-hmm. and uh, and many others. I mean, uh, there, there there was a cast full of just uh, talented people, and you know, I, I was the teenager in the film who I, I going into the trash bin to collect bottles because my mom's divorced, and I'm thinking I can pitch in and turn in the bottles for you know change and help out or whatever. Some silly storyline. And I end up, of course, getting attacked by ants. And, uh, you know, in most cases, the kids, you know, they don't let the kid die. So I didn't end up dying. I ended up screaming and running with ants on my body and into a swimming pool. Okay. And I did that. We did that up in Canada. Real ants, by the way, they put on us. Oh, wow. <laughs> they had a, they had what you call an ant wrangler. And they had these big jugs with a soup ladle. And they would scoop ants and just put them on your body. <laughs> and that's. That's one of the things I lived through. And I had two ants have a fight on my eyelid, and my eyelid swelled up. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they were fighting They, they because the, whoever was trying to get them off my eyes said it looked like they were fighting, but I was getting bit. Oh, yeah. wow. I, I had that experience in Canada, but still love the country. So there. That, I mean, I have that association. <laughs> I still want to move up there. Well, you're welcome to move up here. We've yeah. Had, there's a lot of actors that... Uh, you you know that came up here and just are dual citizens. So yeah, I know that this is true. You ever Maybe been in my? Kid. You ever I'm been not... in my neck of the woods? No, I've only been to Canada three times, and it's all been Vancouver in into Vancouver, and you know throughout British Columbia on location. Yeah, I just made but my. I'd like to. Yeah, I just made my first trip out of New Brunswick to uh, as in Toronto. Went to uh, a, com- a fan convention there as a guest of uh, an actress I've had on my show a couple times. So I'm starting to branch out a little bit because I was told, you know, if I'm doing this re- podcast and interviewing these people, I should get my name out there. And, and she was right, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Well, Moosey, I yeah. hope you're safe from the fires. And I mean that. And I really hope well, you have a Merry you, Christmas. Thank you, Greg, and I hope you're safe from uh, the snow. Although, that, you know, I'm sure you guys are used to dealing with that. We would be, we would know what to do with it. But um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope you're hope you're good up there, and I uh, I really appreciate you inviting me to be on your po- uh, podcast. I hope I didn't ramble too much. Oh no, I think you were great. People want to hear you, uh, not me. You know. 
<laughs> I don't know about that, but okay, I'll take it. Yeah, Appreciate and, uh, you know, uh, celebrating, of course, the 40th anniversary of, oh, God, Jeeper, can you believe it's been 40 years? No, I really can't. I don't, I really can't. It seems like yesterday. Yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before, I what? I was just going to say, I still feel pretty young at heart, so uh, that, that sounds crazy. That No, that's a big number, 40, that you say. But, yeah, I guess it was 40 years ago. Anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted. Oh, no, you didn't. But I'm just going to say, before I let you go, I was wondering if uh, you would mind doing a plug for my show. Okay. Before I do this, I'm going to get my dog who's scratching at the door. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) Go go ahead. I'll just edit. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, give me one moment, Greg. Sure. Go. This is Moosey Dreyer, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert at Python Paradise Media.